I've been farming a long time, but I've been hunting quail even longer. I started as a kid in 1930. The native grasses produce a cash seed and hay crop during the time of the year when I'm not busy with the row crops. When we bought this place two years ago, it really didn't offer much for wildlife. We always wanted a place with plenty of food and cover for quail and other wildlife, too. The future of Missouri quail is directly linked to these men and thousands of rural landowners like them. What they do with their land is of tremendous importance to quail. In fact, land management is a leading factor in determining the quail population and distribution in the state. In the past, the mosaic of small crop fields, pastures, and thickets covering Missouri's countryside were made to order for Bob White, and they prospered. However, land management trends in the 60s, 70s, and 80s have had devastating effects on quail. In many areas where they once abounded, they are scarce or have simply disappeared. It's a significant loss. As the state's favorite game bird, the quail has immense economic and recreational value. And as part of the larger wildlife community, the quail is extremely popular with almost everyone. Its clear, plucky whistle, handsome plumage, and scurrying dash across the road add much to the sweet sights and sounds of rural life. Fortunately, the loss of quail can not only be stemmed, but actually reversed. Almost any farm can have at least a few birds even in view of present economic realities. Sound land management will provide for them. That's certainly within the scheme of things for most landowners. Chester Sykes, Melvin Mecklen, and Mark Havilland all have quail on their land. They represent a broad spectrum of landowners. Their soils are different, their crops are different, and even their levels of commitment to an agricultural livelihood differ. Quail are part of their rural way of life in different ways, too. Chester Sykes owns 640 acres near Herdland, where he raises cattle and crops. We bought 160 acres in 1948, and have been farming ever since. I remember that land was in such a bad condition, the bank appraised it for less than $5 an acre. I harvest 120 bushels per acre corn from it this year, and even better than that on some of my other land. Oh, back. I've been farming a long time, but I've been hunting quail a lot longer. I started as a kid in 1930. I've always loved quails. I wish I could hunt them like I used to, 
but so many years has slowed my walk. But my boys can always get the limit here any time. You can always find the cover in that draw. A lot of people want me to cut it and start farming it. But I don't see no sense of that. It's been there 200 years. It costs a lot of money and work changing it. It cost me more than it paid for the farm. And I can always cut a post out of it if I need one. Sykes likes his crop fields big enough for modern machinery. But leaving that draw and a dozen others like it just seems to make sense. Other decisions and practices Sykes has followed over the years have helped him increase his yields, expand his holdings, and given him the benefit of quail. I leave my boundary fence rows kind of brushery. They make good wind breaks, which cuts back on soil loss. Then when I harvest, I don't ever pull plow. Topsoil is too valuable to lose when it rains. It's dollars and cents for Sykes. He can't run a farm at a profit without his topsoil. But quail share the prosperity. They get some food and cover. These traditional, simple farm management techniques may make Sykes seem old-fashioned, but they work for him, and he is certainly not against trying new things. The various changes he has made over the years present a history of fashionable techniques. When I first started farming, let's believe there was a big crop around here. Everybody grew it, I did too. It was a great feed for quail. Then they come out with fescue. It's got its place. But we found out cattle gain more weight and breed back faster on a different rotation. So we use Timothy and Clover. Timothy and Clover increase cattle production. They also help quail. Fescue makes very poor habitat for them. It grows too rank. From a quail's point of view, timothy and clover are far better because they allow movement while still providing cover. Sykes has done well with sound land management. He leaves brushy draws and fence rows where practical, avoids fall plowing, and he plants a variety of crops. This is certainly not all that could be done for quail. They were not Sykes' main concern, but it's enough to keep the birds as an abundant source of pleasure for him today, just as they've been for half a century. Melvin Mecklen is another landowner with quail on his place. Until about 10 years ago, Mecklen distributed farm equipment. Then he went into farming. He has about 300 acres here on his home farm and manages 360 more nearby. His wife Mary teaches art at a local middle school in Macon. Mary and I both enjoy the farm very much. And the color that goes with it and the wildlife. Uh, I really don't do that much hunting anymore. I have two sons that do, and one of them has bird dogs. And of course, they know pretty much where all the quail are on the farm. One of the many coveys that we find around here are where the hill goes into the bottom. I normally leave corn around the edges of the fields and food plots for the wildlife. It, it costs something, but we feel like it's well worth it. The Mecklen home farm has 60 acres of prime tillable land for beans and corn in a river bottom. The rest of the farm lies on the slopes and ridges above the river. 
Significantly, they've named their place Blue Stem Farms to symbolize the grasses they're restoring to the hills. When we bought this place, there was some evidence of erosion through the tillage practices and grazing practices used. But uh, we're trying to rebuild the fertility level and correct these problems through the use of native grasses and still maintain a profit. I no longer graze the slopes, uh, which has allowed the native stands of grasses to develop. And uh, the ridge tops, many of those I've planted in solid stands of native grasses, such as switchgrass, uh, big blue, also some of them in alfalfa. The native grasses, uh, produce a cash seed and hay crop during the time of the year when I'm not busy with row crops. The alfalfa gives us a hay crop second only to soybeans in terms of net profit. And both the grasses and the alfalfa should rebuild the soil, and it needs it. As the warm season grasses and alfalfa take hold, the quail will prosper. The alfalfa will make good places to find insects a staple for quail in summer, and the grass fields make excellent nesting areas. If the grass stems are left at least eight or 10 inches high, they'll provide good winter habitat too. But perhaps of equal importance for Bob White is what Mecklen isn't doing. He isn't farming marginal land to scrape out every last bale of hay or bushel of corn. Many of the hillsides and draws are not well suited for tilling, so he isn't tilling them. Here in the upper part of the draws, we bush hog every few years in order to keep down the vegetation. The draws themselves, we never plant those because of the erosion. And there's a covey quail in just about every one of these draws. My sons get a lot of birds there. Farther down the slopes are woods, and the woods give the birds a lot of protection when the winter's hard. The quail aren't the only ones wanting protection and security during hard times. The Mecklens need it too. They need more than Mary's teaching salary. They want income from their land. And they want a good farm, one that makes sense in terms of economics, conservation, and the future. They also want wildlife. The farm wouldn't be near as much fun without the wildlife around us. The quail, the rabbit, the deer, the turkey, they're important to us. Mark Haviland is not a farmer. He owns a small manufacturing firm near Lynn. Two years ago, he bought 280 acres for investment and personal pleasure. Since boyhood, he's had a strong interest in wildlife. Haviland grew up in St. Louis, and the home he'll build here in the country will be a dream come true. It will be a place where he can hunt, and show his children box turtles, goldfinches, and a thriving wildlife community. When we bought this place two years ago, it really didn't offer much for wildlife. But it was convenient, had a lot of potential, and the price was right. We uh, always wanted some property that had plenty of food and cover for quail and other wildlife, too. but I'd never even been on a tractor before. And so I figured I needed some help in how to best fix things up. I contacted the conservation department and Dennis McDevitt, one of their wildlife services biologists, came out. He's helped me ever since. Hey, Dennis, how you doing? What do you say, big guy? Good to see you. Mark, this place is looking better every day. It's amazing the changes you made. I remember when I came out here two years ago, there wasn't enough cover for a cardinal, let alone a covey of quail. I'd say you probably have a chance to get a couple limits this fall. Well, I got a bunch of shotgun shells. We'll see about the aim. I'd say you'll get the opportunity. You know, Mark, maybe not this year, but if nature cooperates at all, 
I'd say you'll have one of the best quail populations in the county. Anyway, I brought this aerial photo. I think there's a better way we can do that slope back there. Let me show you. Okay, let's go look. McDevitt's projection for a high quail population has a sound basis. Mark is managing his land for quail. He is converting pastures of solid fescue and overgrazed woodlands into a rich, diverse ecosystem. In a way, I guess I'm sort of making an old-time farm. They had little patches of this and little patches of that to meet the needs of the family. The old farms also had a lot of weedy and brushy areas because it was just too hard to keep everything clean. The Conservation Department has a good idea of what quail habitat should be. If a landowner is interested, we can show him how to have more quail on his land. In Mark's case, he's wanting the maximum number of birds per acre, so he's planning carefully. He's putting it all together right here. Let me know if there's anything else and I'll be by opening day to check on your aim. Everything I'm trying to do in this area revolves around the fact that quail have four basic needs. Grassy areas for nesting, insects for chicks, seeds from weeds or crops, and thick woody cover for winter. If all this can be found within a couple hundred yards of each other, that's ideal. That's what I'm trying to do here. See, in this little area, there's a food plot from the Department of Conservation. Over there, a place that I'll turn into an alfalfa field. I plan to sell hay from it. Beyond that, there's an old field I'll brush hog every couple years with woods right behind it. It's all in an area that's not very big, but quail don't need a lot of land if they have good food and cover. Eventually, right around here on opening day, there may be a covey for every 30 or 40 acres. The whole farm may not be able to support that density because it's too heavily wooded. But I'm working on that. The birds need more than just timber. I'm clearing an acre here or there. I've already got a plot on top of the hill where I hope to get a covey. I put in some lespedeza with a border of weeds. I might even get a couple coveys up there. Obviously, Haviland's land management takes a lot of work. But he wants to do it. For me, running a tractor or building a brush pile is sort of therapeutic. I look forward to it on the weekend. It's the way I relax. He might add he also looks forward to seeing the birds in his fields in summer, to listening to them in the morning, and to years of superb quail hunting. Not every landowner has Haviland's freedom to use land this way. He puts together all the very best things for quail and the quail will prosper. Under the right conditions, there can be a covey for every 30 or 40 acres. But as habitat declines, so does the number of birds. Yet quail can be part of almost any farm. It's simply a matter of good land management. Brushy draws and fence rows and a variety of grasses and legumes help not only the land itself, but also the birds. Whether quail are an important asset of the farm or just one of the extra pleasures of country life is a matter of choice. Conservation, however, is a necessity. The future of Missouri quail and a lot more depends on it. I've always loved quail. You can always find a cover in this draw. The farm wouldn't be near as much fun without the wildlife around us. It's not a big area. But quail don't need a lot of land if it's good habitat.